America, what's next? The influence of America in less than uh, 300 years of her existence uh, has been astounding. Her influence on the world has been absolutely astounding. Last fall, Joyce and I had an opportunity to spend a little bit of time in Washington, D.C., and witness the powerful influence of America that can be found in her seats of power, her buildings, her monuments, her museums, and those places that speak to her past and to her history. God's sovereign hand has been upon the United States of America from the beginning. God's sovereign hand, and we're grateful for that. His divine plan has put America in a position of influence. His divine plan for her, despite her imperfections, continues on today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe in a kingdom that is unmovable, unshakable. I believe in the kingdom of God that that will continue on despite what takes place in the world around us. And I believe in a nation who God sovereignly and divinely planted on the earth to be a nation of influence, a nation of power, a nation that the world could could run to for help in time of need. I believe that God's plan for America has not changed. It has not changed at all. So I want this morning, first of all, to go back to America's roots to see how it began. And to do that, we have to understand two concepts. And these concepts, these truths, these scriptural truths are important for us as we navigate our way through the word this morning. First of all, Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. It tells us exactly how God does things. Remember the former things of old. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. That's who we serve. That ought to encourage you this morning. Now, here's how God does things. He declares the end from the beginning. From ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all that pleases me, all that I have divinely instituted, all that my sovereign hand is upon. How does God do things? He declares the end from the beginning. Now, man starts at the beginning and eventually ends up somewhere. God establishes first his desired ends, and then he starts the beginning. But he knows exactly where he's going. He knows exactly where America's going. He has a desired end, and so because of that, he starts then seeing that desired end come to pass. A second concept is found in Amos chapter 3, verse 7. And it says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, the prophets were the primary way that God spoke to the people of God through, through the prophetic gift. God still speaks prophetically, but the primary way he speaks to us today is not through the prophets, but it's through that inward witness, through the voice of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, God speaks to us. God is still speaking to us. God is always speaking and reveals his plan. I think all of us have heard the voice of the Lord about where we are in the world today kind of at the end. And we know it. We know it. Why? Because the sovereign Lord is is giving us revelation of where we're at and the reason that he leaks information to us is to make us aware and cause us to prepare and to pray. 
So if you want to know what's happening in the world, you don't go to CNN or ABC or CBS or uh, NBC or Fox. Um, if you want to know what's going on, you hear from God. Because what you're going to hear from them is their bottom line. What, what can give me the most power and the most control and the most money? And so how can I assimilate information and get it out to the masses so that my pockets can be lined and we can exercise some form of control over the masses? That's not how the kingdom works. The kingdom works this way. God speaks to his people. God gives us information. Why? Because he knows the end. America, we can arrive at his desired end if we hear his voice. If we hear his voice. So to know our end, I, I want to look at, at the beginning because God has a desired end for America. He sovereignly put it in place for the world. And, and America... Our, our sovereign place in the world mirrors the sovereign place of Israel in the world. There are a lot of correlations that, that we can see. So um, God has a desired end for Israel, and so he began her journey. God has a desired end for America, so he began our journey. How did he begin our journey as a nation, America, knowing what today was going to be, what his desired end for us was going to be. Well, this American uh, Republic was founded on a set of beliefs that were tested uh, in the Revolutionary War. And among those beliefs was the idea that all people are created equal. And, and the reading of it is, uh, and what it speaks to, we're all created equal by the way, God never gives sin equal billing with righteousness. God created all people equal regardless of their natural heritage. So whatever country you came from, whether it was Europe or Africa or, or you're a natural uh, Native American um, we all have been created equal. That's what the Constitution says, and we have fundamental rights. Liberty, free speech, freedom of religion and to worship, uh, due process of law, freedom of assembly. Just some real quick quotes from our founding fathers to show you how God had a desired end for America, and once he put that desired end for her in place, then he started the journey. And how did he start the journey? To look like his desired end. George Washington, we call him the father of our nation. Um, while we are zealously, he said this, and I quote, while we are zealously performing the duties of good citizens and soldiers, we certainly ought not to be inattentive to the highest duties of religion. It should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of Christianity, end quote. Thomas Jefferson, quote, God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that those liberties are a gift of God, end quote. James Madison, I believe he was the fourth president. Somebody want to, is that right? Were you not listening in class? Yes, thank you. You guys are getting really quick on the internet there, real quick. <laughs> James Madison, quote, a watchful eye must be kept on ourselves, lest while we are building ideal monuments of renown and bliss here, we neglect to have our names enrolled in the annals of heaven, end quote. I'd say that's a strong beginning, wouldn't you? Would you agree with me? Well, that strong beginning is was set in place because God knew what the end would be, what he des his desired end for America would be. That ought to encourage you about America today. 
That's the kind of thinking that God wants in America, and he, and he wants it from her people, and he wants it from her leaders today. So by looking at our nation's beginning, we can know what he wants for our end. Just, you know what? Let's all stand together. Can you, can you bring up the Pledge of Allegiance? The, the flag is here to my right, and, I, and it, it's supposed to be this, to the speaker's right, and it is. Can we to, together place our hand over our heart and recite the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. You may be seated. That's God's desired end for America, and we have followed it from the very beginning. That's our pledge as people of America. So what's happened? The better question is what happens next? Because when God warns a nation, they will ex either experience revival, which starts with repentance, or continue the free fall into darkness. And in, in America, we, we have experienced and done both. Uh, when 9-11 hit, and it just threw America into shock, what did people do? They ran to church for a month, maybe two. But they ran to church. Church was full for a couple of months. And then the free fall continued. Why? Because there was no repentance. There was no commitment. There was no consecration. And so we just went on our merry way. And then in 2020, COVID hit. And people scattered into fear. And they, they sought God from afar, but without true repentance, without commitment, without consecration. And the environment of isolation provided them a new way to have a relationship with God from afar. And that, to some extent, continues today. No intimacy, no community. I know I'm preaching to the choir today. And so COVID ended and the free fall continued. So what's going to happen? Is there any hope? Here's what I believe God is doing in the church in America today. Number one, he's calling us to repentance. A familiar passage of scripture to most, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, says this. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, I will heal their lands. Amen. Now, we know the scripture well, and we quote it from the perspective that God wants to heal our land. Biblically, Israel, uh, today, uh, the United States of America, or in, in the nation that we live. But he does want to heal our land. <clears throat> he can heal our land, but it requires repentance. It requires humility. That's a part of repentance. Humility says, you know what? We've tried to right this ship. We've tried to, to do this in, in such a way that, that 
uh, we could uh, make things right and make things good and make things healthy, and all we've done is fail. And so there has to be a humility that we, we can't change things. We can't turn the tide. And we have to turn from our wickedness. In just a moment, I'm going to reveal something to you, but we've got to turn from our wickedness. And if we'll turn from our wicked ways and repent, ask for forgiveness for sin, then he heals our land. Who is this being addressed to? Democrats? Republicans? A sinful world? No. It's being addressed to the church, to the people of God. And what who he is calling to repentance so that our nation can be whole and he can see his desired end for America is for the church to repent. Repent from our wickedness. Repent from our sin. Repent from our evil motives. Repent from what we want and what we desire and how we see things and wholly and completely seek God and call upon his name and allow him to heal us, forgive us, and consequently heal our land. We don't, God doesn't even need the agreement of a sinful, lost, and dying world to heal America. He just needs his church to get right. And if we get right, he'll heal America. And then a healed, healthy, whole church can run into the harvest fields of of people who are lost and dying without Christ and bring them to the Lord and show them this great life that you and I live and not a perfect life, but a great life. And, and America can change. What's next in America is God wants to heal our land because it is broken. And to do that, uh, we need to return to a reliance upon him, church. We need to return uh, to him for revival. We need to re- be revived, church, to live the way we once lived, and it's not going to happen without repentance. How, how does that filter down to each of us individually? Well, make things right with God. Make things right with God, each of us individually. And not only do we make things right with God, then a natural uh, outcropping of that is for us then to make right things with each other, make things right with each other, with one another. Yeah, but what if they don't? We're not talking about them. We're talking about you, talking about me. Make things right with God, make things right with each other, and then acknowledge your weakness. Acknowledge what you can't do. And acknowledge that we need each other. And together we need God. Because we just can't do it on our own, can we? God needs all kinds of people. How many of you know that that, uh, there are people in all of our lives that are challenges for us? EGRs. Extra grace required. And there, we all have EGRs in our life. And we laugh, but, you know, I, I'm probably somebody's EGR. <laughs> and so are you. And, and, and what God is saying is this. You want revival? You, you want to see God do an amazing thing in America? You want your land to be healed? Then you make things right with me, and you make things right with the people around you, 
You acknowledge that you have weaknesses as well as they and acknowledge that they have strengths maybe that you don't have. And we need each other. And as we celebrate strength and acknowledge weakness, then God gets to do what God does. That's what humility is that Second Chronicles 7 uh, verse 14 is calling us to. Psalm 60 verse 2 says this, then after repentance, you have shaken our land and split it open. Lord, we pray, seal the cracks because our land is trembling. You know what God's calling us to? Calling us to prayer. He's calling us to prayer for our land. That's what 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14 says. Our, our, our land is shaking. It's split wide open. It's divided. We're supposed to be one nation under God, indivisible. But Lord, our land is, is so shaking. It's so split. God, you, the only you can seal these cracks and fix what is trembling. The acknowledgement of our need for God must happen in America. And then to pray it, to call upon his name. Secondly, God is not only calling us to repentance, but he's calling us to a fresh commitment to, to him and to his kingdom. Commitment is one of those truths that is not necessarily easy to live. Uh, and uh, at the very least, it's difficult at times to talk about. Uh, so let's just cut to the chase this morning. America needs the commitment of the church to God and to the cause of Christ. Commitment to God, commitment to family, commitment to Bible, commitment to righteous living, a commitment to each other. America needs us to be a committed people. But commitment never comes without a cost, without a price. Luke chapter 14, let me read uh, some, some verses beginning at verse uh, 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, you can't be my disciple. And whoever does not carry the cross and follow me, cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Only first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000. If he's not able, he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for some terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have, you have cannot be my disciples. This is a hard saying, as scripture says. Commitment has a price. The price of commitment is to put God first in your life. And we have spent our lifetime talking about my wife and and my house, and my car, and, and my children, and my grandchildren, and my bank account, and my resources, and my gift, and my calling. And God is saying, give it all up to put me first. Now, when the Bible says, you know, get rid of your mother, and your father, and your brother, and your sister, it's not telling you to line them up before a firing squad. What it's, what it's saying to you is or who are you gonna put first in your life? Commitment has a price. 
Secondly, commitment as a promise. Another familiar passage of scripture is found in Matthew 6, verse 33. It says, seek first. You've, you've considered the price of commitment. Seek first now the kingdom of God. Put God first. Put his kingdom first and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. The, the promise of commitment is this addition to the life you've given up to add something. That presupposes that you're not starting over with nothing. When you give your life, God lets you keep it. When you give your life, God says, okay, you put me first. I'll let you keep your life. I'll let you keep your wife. I'll let you keep your house and your car and your resources and your gifts and your talents, but you're putting me first. And now what I get to do, because you've put me first, is I get to add to your life. I get to start adding. But it takes total commitment. Heard the story of a man who wanted to sell his house. And uh, he didn't really want to sell it, but he was, it was a time when he, he, he needed the resources. And so I put his house up for sale for $3,000. How many of you will buy about 20 of those? Yeah. And put his house up for $3,000. And someone came to him and says, um, I, I want to buy your house, but that's, uh, that's a little bit too much for me. Can, I, can we negotiate the price? And he says, well, I'm, 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 I, I want $3,000. I need to have $3,000. And he says, well, how about 2,500? He says, no, I've got to have three. I'm already giving you a bargain at 3,000. And through the course of negotiation, the man who was selling his house finally agreed to do this. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sell you my house for three thousand uh, for for twenty eight hundred dollars. That's just a bargain price, and I can't believe I'm doing this. But on one condition, I'm going to put a nail in the door, and I retain ownership of the nail in the door. You can't remove it. You can't touch it. It's my nail. And the guy who's buying the house said, okay, let's do this. And they drew up the deal and, and he bought the house for $2,800. Great deal. Well, th after years of, of uh, ha years passed as the house was sold, uh, after it had been sold, and uh, the, the guy who sold it realized what a great house it was, what a history he had with it, and he wanted it back. And so he went back to the guy who he had sold it to and said, I will give you $3,000 for, for the house. And the guy said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna sell it. He says, 3,500. He says, no, I, I can't sell it. It's my home now. He says, 3,600. He says, no, I, I'm, I'm not gonna sell it. And so the next day, the guy came back who wanted to buy his house back, and he had a dead dog. And he hung the dead dog on his nail. And he said to the homeowner, don't touch my property. And he walked away. <clears throat> that man and his family lived... <clears throat> A horrible existence for the next few months with that dead dog rotting on the front door. And, and finally, it just rotted and fell off. And once it fell off, he swept it up and threw it in the trash. The very next day, the guy comes back, puts another dead dog on the nail, which was his. <clears throat> and so the guy says, all right, you win. And he sold his house back to him. What's the story here? What's the moral of the story? We've got to make a complete and total commitment. Because if you leave one peg for the devil, he's going to hang his garbage on it. America, we've got to make a total commitment to God's desired end. And when I say America, I'm talking to the church. 
church, we need to make a total commitment to God's desired end for America. <clears throat> because when we don't, the devil starts hanging, rotting ugliness on the doorstep of this great nation. God's calling us to commitment. Let me, let me end with this. America, and when I say America, I say church. It's time to live with a repentant heart, a committed heart. It's time to return to our beginnings because we know God's desired end. It's time to heed God's voice once again. His voice says, call to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you don't even know about yet. That's the voice of the Lord speaking. Well, over 2,000 years ago, the prophet Jeremiah stood outside the walls of Jerusalem giving Israel a warning. And he said, you were created and molded for a special purpose, Israel. You were created and molded for a specific divine plan. And yet you've turned and walked away from it. And because of it, unless you turn, there'll be judgment coming. 400 years ago, a ship called the Mayflower came to the land that you and I live in. And it was the beginning of another nation created by the sovereign divine hand of God for a divine sovereign purpose on this earth. A, a plan that looked a whole lot like Israel's plan. And that nation is the United States of America. And the Mayflower, when it landed on the shores of this land, made what is called the Mayflower, Mayflower Compact. And embedded in the very foundations of this land is a covenant with God that we, the people of this land, would serve him all the days of our life and glorify him and him alone always. Ten years after the Mayflower, another ship came in, captained by John Winthrop, and he called this new land a city on a hill, destined to give light to the world. And, and he said, if we, this land, this people, will follow God's ways, then it will be the most secure nation in the world. It will be the most educated nation in the world. It will be the most powerful nation in the world. It will be the most influential nation in the world. It will be the most godly nation in the world. These from John Winthrop. We got to go back there. That's God's desired end. And he started our journey to his desired end with these kinds of instances, calling this place you and I live a city set. On the hill. We've got to reclaim what's been taken from us. <clears throat> we've, 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 we've got to reclaim what we have lost. Church, we are the instrument that God will use to reclaim his desired end. And there's a lot of ways to reclaim it naturally, physically, spiritually but we all must repent and commit. We are a city on the hill. We've got to let our light shine. Matthew chapter five, last scripture, verse, verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. Talking to the church, the believers, the children of God, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. I am excited for America, and it has nothing to do with an impending election. I am excited for America, and it has nothing to do with who controls the House or the Senate or the Supreme Court in our land. I am excited for America because I believe the church 
is hearing the voice of the Lord. And the Lord is saying, get your house in order, church. Get right with me. Get right with each other and see if I will not begin to heal your land as you call upon my name. You can be once again the most secure nation in the world, the the most educated, the most powerful, the most godly for a specific divine purpose. But it cannot come without being a city on the hill, being a beacon of light to a dark, dark world. Father, in Jesus' name, we have hope for America. We have hope and a desire to see the end that you knew would come all along. We pray for revival, but we pray for it in us first. Judge, we judge ourselves lest we be judged. We pray with a heart of repentance and the spirit of renewed commitment to the cause and vision of Christ for the land in which we live. And we believe this world will see all that you have seen as everything begins to draw to a close. We honor you and bless you And we declare to you, we are not playing games. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's all stand together. Are you grateful for the liberty God has given us to live in in America? Are you grateful for the freedoms we have? to worship and to honor him as Lord and Savior? Are you grateful for the church of Jesus Christ, the people of God, all of us have different gifts, different callings, different personalities, different ways, but we are one. And just as we declared about our land, we are indivisible. We ought to remember that for the church of Jesus Christ. We are indivisible. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing upon America and your church. We will get the job done. In Jesus' name. Close your eyes before you go. If you're here and you don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, if you're here and You've never experienced the freedom in Jesus. See, sin is, is something that destroys us internally. Uh, it, it, it causes such great grief and pain. It affects our lives and the people around us. And when we sin, when we fall into uh, uh, sinning in, in, and, and living that sin as a lifestyle, Whatever that is, we've walked away from your plan for us, your destiny set over our lives. And today, if if sin has not been, the stain of sin has not been set clean, but the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you on the cross, then You will continue to live your life apart from the one who knows you best, the one who created you, the one who has set a plan in place for your life. Will you say yes to the Lord? The Bible says if you will confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, you will be saved. You can begin the journey today of what it means to have true freedom in Christ. If you're at home watching today or if you're here in-house and you want to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, to cover your sins and be your Lord and Savior. If you're at home watching and the same, 
goes for you. And you want to make Jesus Lord. Maybe today you have served God in the past. You're not serving him today. And you want to. This is your moment. I want to pray with you. But you have to do something very brave and courageous. You've got to ask the Lord to come into your life. To be Lord and Savior. He's committed to you. Will you commit to him? If you're here, if you're watching, you've never made Jesus Lord or you're not right with God today and you want to be. And you want me to pray with you. I want you right now quickly to lift your hand, hold it high and wave it at me. Say, Pastor, it's me. I need Jesus. Pastor, it's me. I got to get right with God. Thank you. I need to get right with God today. It's me. I need Jesus as Savior and Lord. It's me. How about at home? All right, listen, if you raised your hand, I want you quickly to join me right here at the front. I'd love to pray with you. Joyce, come on, join me. Would you? Come on, come on, come on. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, I thank you for your hand on her life. Thank you that today she cries out to you. She calls out to you. God, here's my life. Do with it as you will, as you desire. Today, today is my day. I give you my life. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus, Thank you for loving me, forgiving me. And today, at my invitation, become the Lord of my life. I believe you are the Son of God. You died on the cross, rose again, and today, come to live in my life as Lord and Savior. And from this day on, we will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.